Welcome to Rewind Sunday, a podcast replay of the Sunday morning message from Watermark Church Ashford. Good morning. All right. Welcome to Watermark Church. It's great to see everybody here today. Uh, If you have your Bibles, we're in 2 Corinthians 8, and uh, we're in our series called Legacy. And we do this every year, and our goal is at the end of the year that we do this, what we call a free will offering, where we encourage everyone here to give an offering above and over your tithe to our building fund. And uh, this is an all skate, if you would. Every, we're asking everyone to be involved, everyone to be a part of it. Uh, we want you to start praying about that and asking the Lord what he would have you to give and, uh, and, and really be open to that, be uh, sensitive to that because it takes all of us. We're a church, we're a body. And every one of us matters. Every one of us has uh, gifts and talents and resources and God has blessed you with. And so it takes all of us to be a part of that. And uh, we wanna encourage you to start uh, praying about that. Now, here's what we're gonna do today. Uh, Today's gonna be a little bit different. I'm going to uh, preach uh, probably about uh, through the sermon. We got three points, woohoo! And, and at the end, we're going to have a time of prayer. And we're going to call everyone to pray. Uh, everyone, if you can, to come and at the altar. And we're going to pray because if you don't know, if you've been hiding out, uh, Tuesday's a big day, all right? Uh, Tuesday's a big day for our country. And, and we need to vote. And I encourage everyone here to vote Tuesday. Uh, it's a part of it. And, and today, we're going to talk about that. And, and today we're, we're really focusing on grace and what that does for you and how that um, changes you, how it molds you, how it shapes you into the image of Christ. And, and so today we're going to talk about grace for a while. And really what that means is unmerited favor, that, that God has poured out his unmerited favor on your life. And really, that's the whole thing of 2 Corinthians 8 uh, is the grace of giving. Uh, because we have received grace, now it changes us, it molds us, it shapes us, and, and it changes our worldview. And really, that's the first point today. And we're going to hang out here for a little bit because grace changes your worldview. And what I mean by that, a worldview is everyone here. We look at everything around us, events, um, we look at situations, circumstances, uh, everything that's going on, we look at a world through a certain lens. Uh, and some of us today, we have a worldly lens. Uh, we, that's how we, that's just who we are and that's how we look at everything. Some of us have a selfish lens and so everything's personal, everything's an attack. Everything, you know, we look at the world through those lens. But when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, grace changes your worldview. Not only does it change you, it changes your worldview and how you look at everything that's happening, not only in our personal lives, but it changes how you look at how things are going on in the world. Grace changes your worldview. And in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, Paul drops this gold nugget. I'm talking about gold. If you're ever looking for gold in Scripture, here it is. Paul, the Holy Spirit, drops this gold nugget right here for us today to kind of hang out and look at this. And here's what it says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now, I want to tell you guys, that is gold. And and really, it's given you a picture of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the picture is this, is that a holy God, a God who's never sinned, uh, loved you and I so much that he sent his one and only son and what John 3, 16 says, he sent his one and only son 
that whoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. And so when you look at that, you look at the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived for roughly 33 years. And through those 33 years, he went through everything that you experience as a human being. He went through all of the emotions that you feel and I feel every single day from joy to happiness to despair. How many times did Jesus look at his disciples and says, guys, I've been with you for how long and you still don't get this? Anybody ever thought that with your kids? Hey, Amen, right? Yeah, have I not told you this a hundred times? Yeah, to anger, Jesus was angry. He turned over tables. Jesus was crying. He was sad. He was emotional. All the emotions that you deal with and I deal with, all the sin, the temptations to sin, Jesus met, yet he did not sin. And then on, he went to an old rugged cross. He died on that old rugged cross. And on the third day, he rose again. And one day he's coming back. But it's because of Jesus' death and his resurrection that you and I now those who put their faith and their trust and hope in Jesus, we are rich beyond our wildest dreams. I don't know about you, that's pretty exciting, amen, right? We are rich, yeah, you are rich. And so when you look at the world, if you look at it in a world's perspective and you say, well, you know what, compared to Elon Musk, I'm poor. I got no money compared to Elon Musk, but here's the deal. If Elon Musk doesn't know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, I want to tell you today, no matter how much money he's got, you are richer than him. Yeah, because you have an inheritance that will never, ever fade. You have an inheritance that will never, ever go away. It's secure, and it's secure by Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. And when you look at a holy God and you look at your sin and you come to grips with who you are as a person, right? And you see you're overwhelmed. It just becomes overwhelming the grace that's poured out on your life, the unmerited favor, the gift, the inheritance that's poured out on you from Jesus and Jesus alone. But until you get that picture of who you are as a sinner and who God is in his holiness, man, you won't understand this. So the question I have is this for you today. Here it is. And this is a question you rarely ever deal with. And here it is. What's it like being on the other side of you? Now, I know what it's like being on the other side of them. You know who them are, right? Someone just popped up in your mind, right? I mean, you're, you're critical of them. You know their faults. You know their issues. You know their problems. You know the things they got going on. You know all about them, right? But the real issue today is this. What's it like being on the other side of you? And until you wrestle with that, until you wrestle with your own sin, your own issues, your own problems, and you realize that and you compare it to a holy God. And when you make that comparison and you see the unmerited favor that's been poured out on your life, you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it, man, it kind of runs over you and overwhelms you. And through it, it changes your worldview. It changes your perspective and how you do life. Let me tell you something, young people. It changes who you will marry. It changes how you're going to handle your finances. It changes how you're going to live Monday through Saturday. It changes where, how you're going to use your gifts and talents. Are you going to use them and pour them out for his honor and his glory in the local church? It changes. Let me say this. Here it goes. Y'all ready for this? I don't think you're ready for this, but here it goes. It changes how you vote. Mm. It changes how you vote. 
And when you go to the polls on Tuesday, you don't go with worldly aspirations or worldly things. You go with biblical lens and, and what's best for our country from a godly perspective, not a personal perspective. Amen? Yeah. And it changes everything about you because you've been run over. There's a book out. Haven't read it yet, but I love the saying, you've been run over by the grace train. <laughs> I've been run over by the grace train. Amen? Yeah. And that's what happens when you realize that there is a holy God, right? And if it wasn't for his love that he poured out towards you and me through his son, Jesus Christ, that that saved us in spite of ourselves. And it's the same grace that sustains us every single day of our lives. Man, that kind of grace changes you for who you are. And it changes you how you look at the world and how you deal with everyday issues and problems. And I wanna encourage you today that if you've never been, uh, I'm okay, it's just in my brain. If you've never been run over by the grace train, amen? Today's the day to be run over, amen? Yeah. And you have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to confess your sins and you have to surrender your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you surrender to him. The Bible says you repent and believe. And when you believe, when you confess that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. And so if you've never been saved today, I want to tell you today's the day. Today's your opportunity. Today's your chance to be saved by grace and grace alone the unmerited favor can be poured out over your life today. And I wanna encourage you to respond. Uh, the Holy Spirit is prompting you and drawing you and wooing you. I wanna encourage you not to put it off, to respond because today is the day of salvation. Woo, that's good. If you don't believe me, look here at Matthew 6, 19 to 20. It says this, don't store up for yourselves, this is Jesus, uh, treasures, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where, and where thieves don't break in and steal. And so everything you have right now, just know if it's a house and you're putting all your pride and joy in your house, that at some point another person's going to live in that house. Does that blow your mind? Poof, right? Blows my mind. Also, the car that you drive, at some point, someday, someone else will drive that car and they can have it. Amen, right? Praise God. They can have the house too, right? Right? So listen, listen, this is kind of crazy. Now, this is going to mess with some of y'all. Those guns that you so love, someone else is going to have them, <laughs> right? Eventually, someone else is going to have them. Why? Because you can't take none of this stuff with you, right? You can't take any of it with you. And so if you're putting your hope and your joy and your peace in the stuff, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be greatly, greatly disappointed because there's only one person that can bring you that, and his name is Jesus and Jesus alone. Now look at Hebrews 13, 14. It says, for we do not have an enduring city here, Instead, we seek the one to come. And so there's coming a new city, all right? And that city's coming and we wait for that. Matter of fact, creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation waits for its redemption. And one day when Jesus comes back, not only will humanity be redeemed to himself, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, creation will be redeemed as well. And so we will rule and reign for a thousand years. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And you and I, who put our faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, will get to enjoy the new Eden, if you would. Amen. And that's the city we look forward to. That's this place we long to be. And I want to say this today, that, man, whoever gets elected this Tuesday... Uh, we're not gonna crash and burn. Can I get amen? 
Well, our hope is not in an election. Our hope is in a Savior, and his name's Jesus. And nobody that gets elected Tuesday can bring that to us. Now, y'all keep clapping. I'm just going to keep going. Amen, right? Yeah, that's inspiring. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so today we vote and we live and we strive and we go because we have been changed by grace. And it changes everything about us. The second thing it leads to here in the scriptures is this, is that grace giving uh, leads us to give willingly. Look here in verses 10 through 12. And in this matter, I'm giving advice because it's profitable for you. So what I'm about to tell you is profitable for you, all right? Who began last year not only to do something, but also to want to do it. Now also finish the task so that just as there was an eager desire, circle that word, highlight that word, an e that phrase, eager desire, there may also be a completion according to what you have. Now that's an important phrase there. And look at verse 12. For if the eagerness is there, now this, guys, if you don't get anything else besides the first point, get this. If the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Now, what he's saying there is this, that if there is an eagerness and a willingness and an excitement to give, all right, that you look forward to this, that this is something you want to do, you, you, you get to participate in the overarching thing of what God is doing in our church. You get to be a part of the overarching theme of what God is doing in this world. And when there's an eagerness and a joy to participate, listen to this, the gift is acceptable. All right? Now that's huge. Because if you're mad about it, if you're upset about it, if you're angry about it and you give anyways, guess what? The gift is not acceptable. Now, we're still going to spend it. Hello. <laughs> right? Right? Because we don't know your hearts. We don't know your motives. And you can fool us, but guys, you can't fool God. And in his eyes, it will not be acceptable. And here's the issue. I, I said this last service, but here's the issue. The usually when people get mad when a church talks about money is this. What's happened is money has become an idol in our society. It's become a little g God. And anytime you touch someone's little G God, they get very upset and angry, all right? And they may give, but it's not acceptable because they're mad about it. And so when you give, what happens, grace changes your perspective. It changes your worldview. You now know that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. There's this overarching theme going on in life. You're a minister of reconciliation. God wishes none to perish. So he's looking for people to save, not only here in Asher, but all around the world. And when you give and when you serve, you get to participate in that. And you realize your life, there's something bigger going on in your marriage. There's something bigger going on in your parenting. There's something bigger going on in your education. There's something bigger going on than just attending church on Sunday. God is on the move. God wants to see people saved. And you get to, and you see that and you see the E and you, you, you sense the excitement to be a part of that. And so you eagerly give and that is acceptable to God. Now, I don't know about you. I want my offerings to be acceptable to God. Amen. And the only way to do that is have the eyes of grace and then you give eagerly because you realize this is something bigger than you and that you willingly surrender and you willingly give according to what you have, all right? Does that make sense? All right? 
Because we make a big deal today, and I'll talk about this here in a little bit. But let me save that for the next point. But let me say this. I have no idea what you give, all right? I don't know. I've been in ministry since 1996, and I don't know what any person gives. I've never looked at a role. There's only two ways that I know what people give, all right? Are you ready? The first one is this, if you tell me, all right? So if you plainly come up to me and say, hey, I gave this, then I know what you gave, all right? Does everybody understand? So if, now that doesn't happen a lot, but there are some people that want me to know what they give. So they come up and tell me and that's fine. That's good. That's what you wanna do. The second way that I'm gonna know that you give is if you win the lottery. And you're on TV. I just won $600 million. Okay, 10% of that is $60 million. You can't hide money. So not only am I gonna know if you gave, but the whole world's gonna know if you gave. Does that make sense? Some of you are like, dang it. (laughs) Yeah, you can't hide money. And so we're gonna know. I mean, everybody's gonna know if a $60 million check is given. And, and a lot of, and I got to save it because I'm excited to get there. And so today we want you to know that grace giving gives willingly. And when you give willingly, what? It's acceptable. Now, the third thing is this, grace giving gives proportionally. Look here, uh, we just read eight and 11, but let, let me read 12 again. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what the person has, not according to what he does not have. And so basically you give according to how God has blessed you, all right? Now, some of you uh, and some people in our church, God has put you in situations and circumstances. God has put you in the the right encounters, the right relationships. And because of all of the things God has done in your life, situations, of course, you've worked hard, don't get me wrong, but who gave you that energy? God right? And so God has put you in those situations where you have more resources than other people. And there are some here that you make money, but it's not, uh, when you measure it against someone like Elon Musk, you know, you don't have anything compared to him. And so you have what you have, but here's the deal, whether you have a lot or whether you have little, you give according to what you have and you do it eagerly and that is acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And so a lot of people today, we make a big deal out of big offerings. So if somebody came and gave a million dollars in the United States, we, whoo, that's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. But if you've got $700 billion in the bank, That ain't a whole lot of money you're giving, all right? Does that make sense? That's not according to what you have, all right? That's minuscule to what you have. And so we're to give according to what we have, and that's what's big in the kingdom. Look at this story in Mark 12, 41 through 44. It says, sitting across from the temple treasury, He watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury and many rich people were putting in large sums. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. And summoning his disciples, he said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they all gave out of their surplus But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And so when we look at this, we got to realize that Jesus has a different measuring tape than we have. Amen. And that we're to give according to what we have, uh, not according to what we don't have. And we're to do it willingly and we're to do it eagerly because we realize we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. We're a part of the kingdom movement. And God, don't you dare not see this. God is on the move, guys. And so here's what we're gonna do to close out this service. Um, 
is we're going to pray. And we're going to ask everyone, if you can and you're willing, to come to the altar. And we're going to have a season of prayer. And then I'll close this out in prayer. And then we'll close uh, with our, so- our, our last song our, of worship and praise. But guys, here, here's what I want us to pray. One, guys, the United States is in trouble. I just want to tell you. And it doesn't matter who gets elected, the United States is in trouble. And unless we do a course correction, we're in, we're in deep trouble. All right? Because you can't go on as a nation allowing abortion. All right? You cannot go on as a nation allowing transgender, gay marriage. You, you cannot allow these things and expect God's favor to shine on you as individuals or as you as a nation. It will not happen. Guys, and you could add all kind of other things that are going on, slander, lying, you name it. These things, God will not bless this nation and God will continue not to bless this nation if these things continue, all right? And so we as the church, when you go to vote, On Tuesday, you need to vote with all of those things in mind from a biblical grace perspective that our world and the world that our kids will grow up in and the world that our grandkids will grow up in will be vastly different than the world that you grew up in. And the only hope that we have is not some candidate for president. The only hope our nation has is Jesus and Jesus alone. And guys, we don't, we don't need to make America great again. We need to make America godly again, right? That's, that's what America needs. We, we need to make America repentive again. Repentance. And with all of these things in view, the Bible says in 2 Chronicle that, that we, the church, if my people will repent of their sins, they will turn from their idols and, and they will ask God forgiveness and they will pray, God says he will come and heal their land. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And so healing begins today. And so guys, we wanna encourage you today to to repentance. We wanna encourage you again to holiness and godliness and, and, and leading a life that gives honor and glory to Jesus and Jesus alone. Because here's, here's what's gonna happen. America's gonna to continue to fall because God's favor's not on it. And until we repent and turn Guys, it's not going to happen. And so what this fallen world's going to need is a great church. They're going to need a, an oasis. They're going to need to find a people like you and me that they can run to, that they can be a part of, where we love one another, where we encourage one another, where we hold each other accountable, where we come and we roll up our sleeves and we serve and we give and we're a part of a local church where we do life together and that people can find hope, they can find peace, they can find joy. They're gonna need it in a fallen world. And the only thing that can offer that is Jesus and his church. And we need to be that church. And that's the calling and that's the prayer for our nation, for healing, for repentance. And that guys, we will be the city on the hill that God has called us to be for his honor and his glory. And it requires every single one of us to be a part of that. And so that's the prayer, that's the hope, that's the calling today. So here's what we're gonna do. If you would, and if you're willing, if you would come up here and let's, let's kneel down, let's pray. Um, I'm going to give, they're going to be playing here in the back. Uh, You can stand here at the altar. You don't have to kneel. But this is just a time of prayer, a time of repentance. 
a time to return to godliness and holiness, a time to call out to the Lord Jesus Christ, to heal our land. Guys, we need this more than ever. So as you pray there, I'm gonna give you a time to pray, a time for you to come down, and then I'll close this and then we'll worship together. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. And we thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church and to pray. And God, we ask you right now corporately to forgive us of our sins. God, we have failed you. And God, we need your grace and your mercy to pour out over our lives. And God, we ask you to forgive us as a country. God, we have sinned against you. And only you, and we pray that you would forgive us of our sins and that you would pour your mercy and grace on us again, Father, because we need you and we're nothing without you. Individually today, Father, we, we, we confess our sins, we repent of our sins, we turn to you for grace and mercy that we're absolutely nothing without you. And Father, we pray for this election and God, we pray as we go to vote that we would vote through the eyes of grace and mercy and your word and that we would vote to make America godly again. And that repentance, Father, is what is needed most and that there will be a great revival of repentance, of rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ and that God, that we will turn from our idols we will turn from our small g gods and that, Father, we will follow the one true God, Jesus Christ, and we will surrender. God, we need you. Our country needs you. And forgive us of our sins, God. And we do pray for a government that's not intrusive into our lives. We do pray for a government that works well for all people. And we pray for a government, God, that makes our life easier, not harder that helps us lead a quiet life, a life that's honoring and pleasing to you, that's not overreaching, not full of all of these unnecessary regulations. Father, that they would give up on the myth and the lie of climate change. And that Father, that we can live in a way that brings honor and glory to you as a nation, as a church, and as a people. God, we pray for revival. God, we need you more than ever right now. And we pray that this church will be a city on a hill that people can flock here. They come from the north, the south, the east, the west. And Father, they will find the grace and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that they will find unity. They will find harmony. They will find peace. They will find a people that loves each other, that serves, that's willing to roll up their sleeves and be a part of the kingdom movement that's not only going on in Ashford, but going on all around the world, Father, that we would be that city on a hill for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen.